Hey there, YouTubers, this is Kevin from The Bad Productions. Uh, today, we are going to do a Game of Thrones What If video, which I know I haven't done for a while. Hopefully, you'll enjoy it quite a bit, because I think it's actually pretty awesome. And the subject of today's What If video is, what if Stannis Baratheon, the most popular loser in all of Westeros, actually wins the Battle of Winterfell? What would have changed? Now, obviously, a lot of stuff would have to happen, so we need to kind of go back and alter the events a little bit. So, let's take a second and wind the clock back to Stannis right when he leaves the Wall. He's leaving with a massive force, probably enough to take Winterfell eventually. Now, it's going to take time, but he can probably crack it open at some point. We know as fans that the main reason for Stannis losing is due to the snow coming and then basically getting starved out, making all of his troops leave as a result, okay? And Shireen's death actually kind of played into this as well. That's why on the television show, Stannis Baratheon lost. So in order for this scenario to actually work and even come close to possible is if we remove many aspects of the terrible, unfortunate events that do occur to Stannis during his march. The first one being the Boltons would have to adopt pretty much a totally different strategy. If you remember, Ramsay Bolton ended up getting 20 good men and he went to Stannis' camp and he burned it, he got rid of all their food, all that kind of stuff. Instead, if they had actually followed the Father Roos's advice, they did a wait and see strategy, that would mean that Stannis had actually kept all of his food, all his supplies, all of his siege weapons, probably most importantly for going after Winterfell. Then, Stannis would have a lot more assets to work with and more than likely, the number two thing wouldn't happen, which is the Storm Crows wouldn't have left. So what happens is storm crows end up leaving Stannis after the food is burned and that is about 500 soldiers that's really important also they end up losing all of the horses that they had with them there so they lose about a twelfth of the army okay because Stannis's force is about 6,000 soldiers so that's a pretty significant amount even though it's just a sellsword company pretty important Next, Stannis doesn't burn Shireen because he isn't as hasty to make it to Winterfell if everything around him basically isn't falling apart. Sure, it still needs to stop snowing, but if he moves quickly enough, there's a chance that he can still lay some siege to Winterfell. It's still possible, so he doesn't have to kill his daughter. Which means that his followers who ended up deserting him after that, which ended up being half of his forces, they are going to stick around. So instead of him attacking Winterfell in the show, like he did with about 2,775 soldiers, instead he would have close to 6,000 soldiers, well about 5,500 soldiers. And he would have all the horses because when his soldiers left... After the burning of Shireen, all the horses went. So everyone went to Winterfell by foot. And he had no chance of winning by foot, especially when the Boltons had all that cavalry. Which, by the way, they never actually said it, but I think there's a chance that the Boltons actually ended up getting those sellswords. I'm not sure. We'll see. Maybe in the future they'll confirm it. But anyway, the last point is, Stannis would march to Winterfell through the terrible snow with a force of about 6,000 with siege weapons and food. So they'd have a realistic chance of actually taking Winterfell, even though it'll still be tough. So fast forward from there and BAM! Stannis is taking Winterfell. Hooray, Stannis. Now, what happens? Alright, so with this battle, we can assume that Stannis has taken some serious casualties. Obviously, people are going to be really beat up when you're causing siege to Winterfell, which is one of the best kept castles in the entire Seven Kingdoms. So I'm willing to bet he'd be down to maybe 3,000 or less soldiers at this point. He maybe even get to the 2,000s. I'm not quite sure, but it's going to be quite a bit. It's a perfect time for him to take Winterfell too, because winter is absolutely coming and they need food and shelter away from the storm. Now the Boltons are mostly killed, and what I mean by that is the vast majority of the troops are gone. For sure, Roose and Ramsay will be gone. Many of them are going to be given a chance to fight for Stannis because Stannis knows he needs the troops, plus he needs to be slightly forgiving to the north. I know forgiving is not really in his vocabulary at all, but you know, he's got to actually think about these things if he's going to be the king of the entire Seven Kingdoms. So he kills all the Boltons and he lets everyone know it, especially the Northern Lords, because he's going to need them on his side really quickly. With his army licking its wounds from the tough siege, he will surely need the help carrying out the Lord of Light's mission with all the Lords up in the north, which they'll have some resistance, but I think it's going to be interesting kind of how their allegiances play out. Because most houses likely will support his march on King's Landing uh, because really there's no other game in town and they want to get rid of the Lannisters, which the Northerners absolutely hate. And he will ultimately have to run through the phrase at some point, which again, they ultimately hate. So if he could dethrone the Lannisters, they're going to be totally cool with that. Except for the Mormons. Lyanna Mormon isn't willing to have a king in the north that isn't named Stark. And I have to I have to assume that she's not willing to support anyone who's going to take the Iron Throne that also isn't a Stark. But that's okay. It's not that big of a loss anyway. She can take a little sassy pants and stay on Bear Island if she wants to and miss out on the show. Now, I have to step 
into another storyline for a second to complete this train of thought here about Stannis Baratheon, so bear with me a moment. Considering Stannis wins at Winterfell, that means that Jon Snow still dies, but most importantly, no Melisandre at the Wall to revive him. And that means that the Wildlings are pretty much open for business to be killed. So if the Night's Watch can't do it, they can't just kill all the Wildlings, which I don't think that they're going to be able to. I don't think they have the guns to do it. The Umbers are going to be the house that's going to encounter them first, and they will most likely be the ones that take them out. So if it's just the Wildlings versus the Umbers, there's a pretty strong chance the Umbers can take them down, but they're going to lose heavy casualties. So in sum, Jon Snow, if he does die up there with no one to revive him, he is going to be dead for good. Thor Samir is going to be long ways away, so he's not going to be able to do it either. Which, that means if Jon's dead, that's obviously going to cause a lot of issues long term in the future, but I'll jump back to that in the future of this video, so just bear with me here. But going back to it, so with the Karstarks, the Manderleys, the Glovers, the Ailing Umbers, the Hornwoods, and the remaining Boltons that had switched to Stannis' side, Stannis has quite the formidable army to attack King's Landing, I'd say. I know many will say that they're not going to go under a southern ruler, they're not going to follow Stannis Baratheon, especially after the rousing speech that they had given to Robb Stark, but if they hear Jon Snow is dead, all the other Starks are gone, with the exception of one, which I'll talk about in a second, and the Boltons were killed, Stannis' offer of taking back King's Landing and bringing things back to how they were under his brother Robert Baratheon has to sound pretty enticing, I'd say. So, after all, I mean, many supported the Traitor's Boltons even after they had gotten rid of their constant Wardens of the North, the, uh, the Starks. So, it seems as though the North is a lot more flexible than they make it seem like. But before we go that far, we have to mention Sansa Stark, which I was referencing a second ago. With Stannis taking Winterfell, Sansa is safely in the hands of the Baratheon army and would fall under his protection, and he would actually use her in many ways. Because remember, Sansa left with Theon only after she saw Stannis was defeated at Winterfell. If Stannis came knocking at the gates and eventually got in there with Sansa Stark still alive, because you never know what that psychopath Ramsay Bolton would do, she is going to end up being safe. And after all, she's going to be need to be used to basically keep a hold on the North. She is really important to that. I mean, essentially, she ends up being the heir to Winterfell for all intents and purposes at that point in time, because you don't know when Rickon or Bran are or Arya Stark for that matter. So he's going to accept her help. Stannis is going to make her the heir to Winterfell, the official warden of the North, essentially. He's going to hand that over as long as the North sticks by her and then intransitive property sticks by Stannis. So with all that support up in the North, Stannis just basically has to spend time regrouping and will attempt to attack King's Landing eventually. He's probably going to spend a little bit of time trying to rebuild Winterfell for Sansa, but ultimately he doesn't care. Like he said, we only move forward, not backwards. Now with Sansa comes a little bit of a problem. Reek. Reek the Greyjoy. Most likely he's going to be around and not be killed. I mean, there's a chance he could, I suppose, but let's say he's around. He's kind of an interesting case because I can see Stannis killing him instantly when he knows it's Theon Greyjoy, and even if he doesn't, he's going to see that he's got some kind of like freaky mental guy that he needs to kill, so that may happen. Or, if he knows who he is, he may try to use him as leverage to get Balon Greyjoy on his side, or at least stay out of the fray, which I don't think he would have a problem doing, but the problem is, with Stannis seeing Theon um, being in the condition that he is, he may think it's kind of useless, but even if he does try to appeal to the Greyjoys, Euron takes over for Balon not terribly long after, so I can't say that that tactic would ever work. I mean, Euron would be thrilled, actually, if, uh, if Theon would get killed. So I don't think Theon would be much of use for anything, and ultimately I think he would die uh, pretty, pretty soon after, if not immediately. So I don't think he's going to be too much use. That's going to be the end of the story there. I mean, it could mean the end of Yara, but she probably still seeks out Daenerys anyway, the way that she does. And I assume Daenerys is going to accept the proposal, although I know Theon did kind of help make that work. I don't know. It's up in the air, but I let's just assume that Yara is down with the idea of having another woman ruler in Westeros who is ready to change the way their society works. Okay, going on from the Greyjoys, we want to kind of go further down south to King's Landing. At this time, King's Landing is in the midst of chaos, as Cersei, Marjorie, and Lars are imprisoned, with Jaime and Dorne, but he's about to return, and the High Sparrow running Tommen as king. So the High Sparrow is basically running the crown at this point. With only his uncle Kevin as counsel, it'll not be so fun for this boy to try to strategize against a Stannis Baratheon who just took Winterfell and is gone to gain allies pretty quickly. 
So probably by the time Stannis were to start marching, Jaime is back to help, which is great for Tommen, but he's trying to sort out the whole Cersei thing. Cersei does her Walk of Atonement, and she's back. But the problem is she doesn't have any real power with the High Sparrow telling Tommen what to do. The Tyrells are pissed at the Lannisters for getting them in this situation in the first place, but they're kind of stuck together in a weird situation because Stannis kind of hates the Tyrells. After all, Marjorie did try to, uh, yeah, well, Marjorie did marry Renly Baratheon and they tried to fight against Stannis Baratheon. So I can see why he would be unforgiving about that. But it's, it's interesting because even though Stannis will need them ultimately because of their money, but actually he's kind of a perfect person for the Tyrells to really fix their problem. Because if Stannis marches on King's Landing and he actually gets in there, the first thing he's kind of known for, other than being unwavering, is that he is a servant of the Lord of Light. So he'll go in there, go to the Sept, he will see their gods and just basically burn it all in their name. So he would effectively kill the High Sparrow and get rid of everything that the High Sparrow is associated with and install his own new thing. So that's actually kind of a win-win, I think, for those two. Alright, so with all that cool stuff, next a wild card as always is Littlefinger. With him arriving at the Vale, he wants to use their army to protect Sansa, and he doesn't know that Stannis is, like, for sure dead, so he ends up bringing his army north anyway to protect her and exert his will on Winterfell. I mean, I can see him hearing about Sansa being named Temporary Warden of the North and Littlefinger coming up to join her while Stannis is there, although he's about to march. So, doing normal Littlefinger things, he pledges the Vale to Stannis, fight reminiscing about Robert's Rebellion and how the Aarons, the Starks, and the Baratheons all teamed up to take down the Mad King. He's going to play on that. Stannis is going, yeah, sure, whatever. It's nice to have the numbers. Thank you very much. You know, the Vale is arguably the best army in Westeros. I mean, not that they have the most soldiers, but they are arguably the best trained or at least most versatile. So it's good to have them on board. Littlefinger is going to allow the army to march with Stannis, although I'm sure she's going to keep some behind um, for quote-unquote protection of Winterfell, which is really just Littlefinger establishing control there and exerting his will. Um, that'll probably stay for quite a while. I think Littlefinger would be there for a bit. Decent chance Arya's storyline will, you know, lead her to Winterfell, just as it does on the show, where it ends up being her, Littlefinger, Sansa. Except after so hearing Sansa is Lady of Winterfell, rather than Jon Snow being Lord Commander and taking back Winterfell. Also, just another Stark, the storyline with Bran kind of gets dicier, but ultimately I think he makes it back to Winterfell as well. Uh, the man of the Night's Watch didn't really hate the Starks. I know he went through before, it was like, well, I'm the brother of Jon, and that kind of got him through, but... The men of the Night's Watch didn't hate the Starks or anything. They really didn't even hate Jon all that much. They just had a problem with his leadership of liking the Wildlings. So there's a decent chance that if it's Brandon Stark along with Mira Reed, he'll actually get through. Whatever Moran is in charge of the Watch at the time, which is probably Alistair Thorne still, will let him and Mira Reed go through and eventually hit Winterfell. With that case, Littlefinger's story is probably going to come to an end similarly how it does on the television show at the hands of the Starks. Whether it be Arya slicing his throat or not, Bran still has all the secrets, and I'm sure he's going to divulge those to his two siblings. So, with all I've said so far, right now, where are we at? We are at Stannis fixes up Winterfell a little bit, asks for armies to march on King's Landing, and he gets most of them from the north in particular, but he also gets the Vale, and he would more than likely get River Run. There's going to be roughly uh, a month or three weeks for them to march onto King's Landing, because, you know, it takes about a month, but let's assume they'll go fast, so three weeks. And if they go by sea, which they should, they should split up a little bit, it'll probably even be shorter. It goes without saying, however, that with King's Landing being in total chaos, how it is, Stannis absolutely will take it, and no one will realistically oppose him. I mean, I could see the Tyrells last minute also changing sides, but that really depends on Stannis if he can save Lars and Marjorie, which I think he can. Uh, it's just a matter of how Stannis-y he wants to be, like, oh, you betrayed me once, I'm gonna kill you. But if he just acts diplomatic for like one freaking second, he could probably get the Tyrells on his side. So let's assume Stannis isn't so Stannis. He considers letting them live since he has the throne at this point. He can make these decisions where they're unifying instead of basically do exactly what I say or you will die. Yeah, maybe he doesn't do that this time around. So let's say he actually saves them, trying to be smart for the sake of unifying all of Westeros and the Tyrells back Stannis. Lannisters are totally wiped out. If Jaime's around, he dies. That means Cersei, dead. Tommen, dead. That's going to be pretty awesome. As a Lannister fan, that sucks, but yeah, what can you do? 
the phrase an ally of the Lannisters are sitting ducks if they're not already destroyed at this point they're a family that cannot save themselves because Stannis hates the phrase I mean everyone really hates the phrase and all of the North hates the phrase so really they have no game left in town to stick with the kind of cool thing is that the Blackfish gets to live in the scenario with his Tully men and uh, I can see him actually being a pretty big fan of Stannis's cause uh, not necessarily because of the whole like you know uh, Lord of Light stuff but more so I think he just I think he just likes Stannis, even though he's a little bit rigid. Uh, Edmure is still the Lord of Riberon, but eh, whatever. As long as the Blackfish lives, I'm willing to deal with Edmure. Now, with unification in mind that I had talked about, Stannis sends letters to bend the knee or else, since there's a great war to come. Melisandre has been hyping this up quite a bit. Stannis is what he's been working for. He gets notifications about Daenerys going to come at some point, so he starts getting his allies ready to fend her off while preparing for the North. Note that he's aware of the Dragonglass on Dragonstone, so we would have a factory kind of going and making daggers on Dragonstone, much like Jon Snow asked Daenerys for it in Season 7. However, eventually, Daenerys and her forces, which will include, you know, part of the Greyjoys, the Martells most likely, Unsullied, Dothraki, etc., they will try to attack King's Landing altogether, but fortunately the Tyrells will stick with Stannis, so he has all that gold to pay the Iron Bank, and he can bring over... Um, I don't know, you can bring over the Golden Company if he wants to, to fight with him too, but I don't know if that's going to save him too much. So eventually, Daenerys is going to land. That's going to happen, okay? But where would it happen? With Stannis and King's Landing and Danny coming from Marine, it makes most sense, I think, that Danny's troops to loop down to Sunspear and land at Storm's End. She could land in Dragonstone, but it's a hard place to capture when it actually has people there, which I think Stannis would uh, still have some folks there, although most of his troops, of course, would be with him in King's Landing. So she could stop at Dorne in March, but it's probably not necessary. I mean, she could probably just have Dornish troops begin their march up from Dorne, while Storm's End has all of Daenerys' ships and her dragons right there. So if they can take Storm's End, they immediately get the home of the Baratheons, which is going to be dealing a pretty big blow to Stannis Baratheon, not only to his pride, but also to his strategic holdings. And Daenerys, I mean, when she takes Storm's End, she trashes the armies of the Reach, and the only person who really stands a chance at actually fighting back is Randall Tarly, but when the dragons are involved, no one really has a chance, so they're basically going to get trashed, the state is going to lose his allies in the Reach. I, I know, it sounds pretty familiar, right? But it looks like she's going to be able to secure the Westerlands, I think, through Tyrion's name. And just seeing the dragons, and everyone's just kind of bow to her, pretty much. And then they finally make their assault on King's Landing to an eventual victory. With Stannis Baratheon killed, because you know how he is. You go on, do your duty. He's not gonna. He's not going to bend the knee to Daenerys, no matter what. Even if I think Melisandre said so, he's been told this whole time he's the savior. I don't think he'd believe anything else. And Melisandre, speaking of her, she would probably go in hiding until eventually realizing that Daenerys is who she needs to be working with. And she will come back and become a lackey to Daenerys, sort of like she actually has done on the television show. Except maybe she would stick around a little bit longer before she ends up going across the Narrow Sea to Essos. So now that we have Daenerys on the Iron Throne, she is the one in charge of Westeros. That was kind of inevitable, I think. Uh, touching on her and Jon, what happens in Season 7, obviously that can't happen this time around. With no Jon and no Cersei, there's, there's no reason for the excursion to go beyond the Wall to get a white. They need to get a white to show Cersei to convince her to fight with everyone. But Cersei isn't around, and Jon's not around to do it. So they don't need to go, and Danny doesn't really fully believe in the cause anyway. Jon kind of convinces her. I'm sure if Stannis, before his death, tells her about it, and the Dragonglass, like, factory he's got going on on Dragonstone. Plus, he has Melisandre who's going to tell her about it. Plus, an interesting wild card kind of thrown in there to help the argument is uh, Samuel Tarly. Samuel Tarly was down in Old Town and he was learning to become a maester for the Wall. I think eventually when he is at the Citadel, I mean, he is going to encounter Jorah Mormont still to get a cure for Grayscale. And when he gets rid of that Grayscale, Jorah is going to go by Daenerys' side. And I think Sam at some point is probably going to encounter her. And he is one of the few people that's actually going to be able to connect with Daenerys Targaryen and say what he saw. I mean, he's Sam the Slayer. He ended up killing one of them. So he's going to be important for that. And if she ends up meeting the Lords of the North, I mean, meet Sansa, but particularly Bran, Bran is going to be one that's going to have to talk to her, and there's probably going to be some spooky way he's going to be able to prove it to her that they're coming. So she's going to basically get all the forces of the country together. And that's where I think that's pretty interesting. Um, also, just a quick note, Euron Greyjoy, I know he is, you know, someone that's supposed to be playing into this, but I think once Daenerys kind of establishes herself, 
uh, yeah, he flees to Essos and he doesn't come back. He's pretty comfortable with sailing around the world. I don't think he would ever step foot again into the story until, I don't know, maybe like 20 years down the line. Um, and that's, you know, how is that possible? We'll talk about that in a second. But um, the main thing with John dying, which I was just talking about, is that there's no ice dragon for the Night King to take from Daenerys. There's no ice Viserion that he can ride and tear down the wall. So it's really unlikely that the White Walkers can actually get past the wall. I mean, technically, you could argue it, because people to this day are still arguing it, that technically Bran took the magic away from the wall. Because when the wall was built, supposedly it was enchanted with some kind of magic that also stops White Walkers from going through. That's why the big moment where Bran was having a fing you know, finger quotes here, a vision, and the Night King ended up touching him, it basically ended up removing the magic from the Blood Raven's cave, which the Night King couldn't get into, but once he touched Bran, he could. So the thought is that once Bran ended up going through the wall, the Night King could get past the wall. So let's say even that's taken off. I don't know how they're going to take down the wall. It's still huge and it's still made of ice. I mean, all they have is ice. If they had something of fire, maybe, but they don't. And they ended up getting that with a dragon. So if they don't have the dragon, I don't think they get past the wall no matter what. They can't do water. We already know they can't swim. So maybe they freeze it? But I don't know. They have like freezing capabilities. They're not like Todoroki or Iceman or anything. So, kind of, what I gotta say is, like, dare I say it, Stannis Baratheon, the most popular loser in all of Westeros, winning at Winterfell, it, it ensures that Jon's death happens and some other bad things, but it seems to be the best guarantee that the White Walker army doesn't march north. I mean, at least that's all we can really go off of since they, you know, that, that's the information we have. Even with that said, I assume there's got to be some kind of conflict with the White Walkers. Like, they have to be dealt with somehow. They're not going to just hang behind the wall and do nothing. So, but like, even if that's the case, if Daenerys gets to keep her three dragons and the wall is still up and they have a bunch of dragonglass weapons, in theory, they could unite all of Westeros, attack that army, and they'll probably win. Uh, if they somehow get rid of all three of the dragons and they become ice dragons, then I, maybe that's a different story. But I have to imagine that Daenerys and the forces of Westeros will end up winning that whole bout, and uh, they'll kind of go on somewhat living peacefully, I guess you could say. I assume that a Daenerys would make it out in the end, so she would have to figure out what to do. I mean, who would be her new honey to mack on? I mean, right now, obviously, it's Jon Snow, but uh, like the problem is most of the good dudes are dead, like the ones with great names. Tyrion makes a lot of sense, but I think they have kind of a too much of a brother-sister relationship. Also, they may actually be brothers and sisters. So, uh, the, the poss I, I'm not really sure I see that. Gendry, I know he's got royal blood, but she doesn't care. She don't care about Gendry. No one cares about Gendry at that point. Um, so, I can't see him being it, but you may get to a point where actually Jorah may realistically end up being the answer as to who Daenerys falls in love with. Uh, he is a boy of the North, even though he was disgraced, but if he ends up saving them against the White Walkers, that's going to be a pretty big deal. Or, I think kind of a wild card is Rickon Stark, who is still around. Um, if, you know, obviously if Jon Snow is dead and Stannis takes Winterfell, Rickon is still kind of floating around with the Umbers. So, he would be a possibility because she would have a connection to the North. Davos isn't a real option, and he may have been killed at this point anyway at either the skirmish up at the Wall when the Wildlings were all killed, or at King's Landing when Stannis took King's Landing. So, it's really up in the air, but I, I just don't know. Either way, Danny is probably going to be hooking up with a northern boy, <laughs> most likely, but is she going to have a baby? Probably not, but again, that's kind of up in the air. I mean, with John being around, it made sense they would have a baby, this like ultimate savior baby, like the savior of the, the ice world and the savior of the fire world combined together to make an ice and fire baby. I'm not sure that would be the case because like, like Jorah or Rickon's not going to be like the ultimate ice savior or anything, so... It, it probably doesn't work as well, but I don't know. She could. It's it's just it's just sad because without that kind of John character, it ends up being anticlimactic as far as a fantasy epic goes. So yeah, kind of with all that said, I think uh, Westeros is saved if Stannis wins, even if he doesn't stay on the throne for longer than a year. So uh, yay, Stannis, I guess. So what did you think of this what-if scenario? Leave a comment down below if you agree with kind of the outcome I came with, which is pretty much Stannis Baratheon winning the Iron Throne is awesome for everyone, except for probably Stannis Baratheon. But if you disagree, that's also cool too. Leave that down below in the comment section. Maybe you'll even mention why I didn't say anything about Brienne of Tarth. Spoiler alert, she dies. 
And if you want to check out more of my videos in the future, all you have to do is hit the subscribe button. Make sure you get notifications as soon as I upload a new video. Also check out these cool playlists here. I have others from my Game of Thrones What If playlist and also some other fun Game of Thrones videos for you down below. Hope you have an amazing day, everybody. You take care. Goodbye.